This is Open Line with today's host, Father Wade Menezes. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Welcome to EWTN's Open Line Tuesday with our host and executive vice president in charge of making sure the autofocus on his webcam is working, Father Wade Menezes. We'll get to him in just a moment, but if you would like to be part of the program, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, the number is 833-288-EWTN. I wonder if that includes a higher paycheck. <laughs> That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is one 271 2985 And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at one 205 271 2985 and you can always send an email that email address is open line at ewtn.com i'm jack williams michael mccall producing the program your call screener is matt gubensky and ace mckay handling our social media efforts so if you're watching us on youtube or facebook live you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program and our host as he uh, is every Tuesday, the aforementioned Father Wade Menezes, you really you work out the autofocus on that webcam of yours every week with your pens and your mugs and all of your right. EWTN <laughs> paraphernalia. That's right. Got, got to get the word out. Got to get the word Maybe out. Maybe that's the eighth <laughs> gift of the Holy Spirit. It, it could be. G- good promotion. Good promotion. <laughs> Specifically of EWTN. <laughs> Speaking of which, the Holy Spirit and his gifts. That's what I want to talk about today in our springboard. You know, we've entered officially now into the 50-day Easter season as of the Sacred Triduum, and Pentecost Sunday this year is on May 19th. The previous Sunday in most dioceses will be the Ascension on the 12th, but on the 19th of May, we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, the coming forth of the Holy Spirit, the sending of the Holy Spirit, upon the Apostles and the Blessed Virgin, and the birthday of the Church in regards to her evangelization. So today I want to talk about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and explain each one a little bit. I like to do this annually because they're beautiful gifts, and I like to provide catechesis on them. Of course, the seven gifts, uh, Jack, we receive from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, wherein that biblical passage refers to the characteristics of a, of a messianic figure uns- understood by Christians to be Jesus Christ, empowered by, quote, the Spirit of the Lord, end quote. And the seven gifts are wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. And they are gifts of the Spirit, per se. And so I want to comb through each one first uh, in a very brief manner, then I'll go into into detail a little bit. Uh, Wisdom basically helps us to detach from the world. It makes us relish and love primarily the things of heaven. Our wisdom is focused on the highest goal, the pietific vision, right? Eternal beatitude. The gift of wisdom is our ability to value spiritual things over worldly ones. It enables us to desire the things of God and correctly order the things in our life that are temporal and spiritual. This gift of the Holy Spirit helps us view the world through God's perspective and the light of our Catholic Christian faith. It instills a desire to contemplate the things of God. The gift of understanding helps us to grasp the truths of our Catholic faith as far as is necessary to attain salvation. Understanding helps us uh, in our intellect, for our intellect cannot grasp all of God's mysteries. That's why they're called mysteries. We wouldn't know them otherwise unless they were revealed for us. But through the Holy Spirit's gift of understanding, we can be led to truth even when we do not fully comprehend it. This gift strengthens our insight through prayer, scripture, and the sacraments. Knowledge, I love this one, knowledge points us to the correct moral path to follow and the dangers to avoid in order to ultimately reach heaven. Knowledge, we can say, Jack, is an awareness of God's plan. It is not simply an accumulation of facts, no, but rather an understanding of God's purpose and how we ought to respond Uh, to the Holy Spirit's gift of knowledge that helps to bring to light the temptations that we face so that we can 
um, face them head on and overcome them, and to strive for a certain resoluteness uh, to live a life worthy of God's approval. The gift of fortitude or courage is the next one. I love this one as well. It gives us courage to overcome obstacles and difficulties that arise in fulfilling our faith-based and religious obligations, especially when it is necessary to defend the faith, right? Uh, Courage or fortitude sustains our decision to follow the will of God in any given situation, and it allows us to stand up and defend our faith even when threatened by bodily injury or death. And we see this especially in a way par excellence in the way of the red martyrs of the church. This gift uh, also allows us to be steadfast in our decisions to do well and to endure evil when we do not want to. Again, that gift of courage, right? The gift of counsel or of right judgment, as it sometimes is listed, Uh, It enables us to see and choose correctly what is the will of God in my life and in the world, and to conform to that will of God. Uh, The gift of counsel or right judgment acknowledges the difference between right and wrong and bestows proper judgment on the human intellect and will work together to love and choose what is good the good, the true, and the beautiful, and to pursue those things, right? A person with right judgment avoids sin and leads a life for Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's gift of counsel inspires us to speak up and encourage others to do the right thing or the correct thing. Uh, The gift of counsel or right judgment bestows upon us prudence, one of the four cardinal virtues, allowing us to act promptly and rightly in the face of difficult situations. That's very, very important. You know, the four cardinal virtues are called cardinal from the Latin cardo, meaning hinge, because the totality of our moral life hinges on those four cardinal virtues, and prudence is often listed as the first of the four, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Uh, The gift of piety or reverence uh, inspires us with a tender and filial love of God, a filial love of God as opposed to a servile love of God. Filial is the love of a child from the Latin filius meaning son, who doesn't want to disappoint the parent, not because he fears that a punishment would come if he did disappoint the parent. No, not at all. Rather, he's afraid of disappointing the parent precisely because he knows the parent loves him. So filial fear is the fear of not wanting to disappoint, where servile fear is the fear of not wanting to disappoint precisely because you know or you believe that a punishment will come. Well, that's not the kind of fear of the Lord we're called to have in our gift of piety or reverence from the Holy Spirit. We're called to have a a filial fear, a tender and filial love of God. Uh, This gift of piety or reverence, Jack, is our obedience to God and our willingness to serve Him. Uh, It is not just obedience through a sense of duty or obligation, no, but rather obedience out of love and devotion. It facilitates a deeper respect and honor for God and His church. And lastly, the fear of the Lord, sometimes listed as wonder and awe in God's presence or reality. The gift of the fear of the Lord makes us aware of the glory and majesty of God. It fills us with love for God and the fear of offending Him. Uh, This gift is synonymous with the fear of the Lord that we read about in Scripture, in which we dread sin and fear offending God, not again out of servile fear, no, but rather out of filial fear, which I just explained. We fear displeasing God and losing our connection with Him because of our love for Him. The Holy Spirit's gift of wonder and awe increases our desire to draw closer to God and depart from sin. So there you have it, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to invite our listeners today, Jack, either watching or listening live this hour to call in and share with us, have you ever focused specifically on the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit during this Easter season? Uh, in the past or currently, uh, to grow in these very seven areas. Or maybe you took on one. Maybe you attended a retreat on the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and you were led to, to be inspired through the retreat to focus just on one or two. What were they and why? Give us a call. Give us a witness today. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, fortitude or courage, counsel, piety, also known as reverence, and fear of the Lord sometimes described as wonder and awe in God's presence and reality. And as we progress now to May 19th, Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, I will be talking more not only about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit as these weeks progress now during this 50-day Easter season, Jack, but also about the 12 fruits 
of the Holy Spirit. And to give a little, a little glimmering of those, they are charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. And we receive those from Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. Most New Testament translations list nine, but we have 12 in our Catholic tradition because of St. Jerome's Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible lists 12. So there you have it. Give us a call today. Give a witness about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Linda, hang in there. You're going to be first up. We've got plenty of time and a couple of open phone lines for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade. Hi friends, Janet Williams here. Join me every Wednesday on Women of Grace Live as I welcome new age researcher and blogger for Women of Grace, Sue Brinkman. Sue and I will be talking about all the wacky things that could distract you from your faith. Psychics, yoga, Reiki, crystals, acupuncture, Ouija boards, tarot cards, and astral traveling are just a few of the stranger things we discuss. That's why we call it Wacky Wednesday. So join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is a Pro-Life Minute with doctors Stephen and Gracie Christie. Steve, here's a pro-choice argument which has never made any sense to me, that an embryo or fetus is unaware of its own destruction, so abortion simply doesn't matter. Yeah, I hear that a lot. Awareness of harm has never been required to make an act morally wrong, nor should it. A drunken woman, for example, passed out at a fraternity party might never know she was raped by three men. Does her lack of awareness somehow make the rape acceptable? Of course not. A morally wrong act is morally wrong whether or not it is observed or felt. You could say the same for a patient under anesthesia, completely unaware of what might be happening to her body. We always treat such patients with the utmost respect and care despite their being totally unaware of their circumstances and their bodily integrity. Absolutely. For more on the culture of life, go to EWTN.com slash pro-life. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's one 833 288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, for over 40 years when Father Wade was just a toddler, EWTN has been praying with and for people throughout the world. And today we want to pray for anything that weighs on your heart, such as family members, health, finances, anything at all. It's our honor to pray for you. So please take a moment now and send us your prayer request. It's easy to do. Just go to EWTN.com slash prayer. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. First up today is Linda in Omaha, Nebraska, listening on Spirit Catholic Radio. Linda, thank you so much for holding. You're on with Father Wade. Father Wade, I have a question about Divine Mercy Sunday. In the diary, Jesus says, The souls that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. So I did go on Divine Mercy Sunday, Confession, Communion. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, it's it's a plenary indulgence doubled with an extraordinary grace that is a, a proper only to the divine mercy devotion itself. So uh, I had seen that with our call screener, you had asked, uh, do you have to go to confession on the day of? You don't need to go to confession on the day of. I want to direct our listeners to it, a, a wonderful, wonderful website that is uh, tied to the Marians of the Immaculate Conception in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, uh, a Polish-founded community, uh, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, and they were the postulators of St. Faustina's cause in this country of the United States at the request of John Paul II, going back decades ago, uh, precisely because they have a Polish foundation. So this is why the Marians of the Immaculate Conception 
uh, have done so much to promote the Divine Mercy devotion, Faustina's cause up to her being declared beatified uh, in 93, I believe it was, uh, all the way up to her canonization during the Jubilee year 2000. She was the very, very first saint canonized at, in the new millennium, at the dawn of the new millennium. And so they have a, a wonderful website that's uh, the address of which is thedivinemercy.org, thedivinemercy.org, all lowercase, all one word, thedivinemercy.org. And uh, a lot of people ask, when do I need to go to confession? Well, you, do, you don't have to go to confession on Mercy Sunday itself, okay? We know this from Faustina's own diary, that she herself made her confession in preparation for Mercy Sunday on the day before, and we know that from paragraph number 1072. In fact, all of Lent, all of Lent should be a preparation to make a good confession to receive Holy Communion worthily on Easter Sunday and on the following Sunday, which closes the Easter octave celebration, the second Sunday of Easter, now officially known as Divine Mercy Sunday as well. So all of Lent should be a time of preparation to make not only a good Easter communion, but also the closing day of the octave, Divine Mercy Sunday. Uh, sin is the only obstacle to our fervent reception of Holy Communion worthily, and our sins can be wiped away by the Sacrament of Reconciliation, Holy Confession. The important thing is to receive Holy Communion on these great feast days of Easter and Divine Mercy Sunday in a state of grace that is simply with no known mortal sin on your soul, with your sincerity of heart, you're not aware of any mortal sin on your soul, uh, and with great trust in God's mercy. So don't wait until the day of to go to confession. That's a very legalistic type of, a, of approach. And we don't really find ourselves uh, advancing in the spiritual life when we do that type of thing. Now, I'm not saying you did that. I say it simply as a teachable moment because of, um, of, of others who only go to confession on the day of Divine Mercy Sunday. And this is uh, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception official website uh, for the Divine Mercy devotion and all of these frequently asked questions about it. So John Paul II uh, attached a plenary indulgence to Divine Mercy Sunday. Uh, the plenary indulgence for Divine Mercy Sunday has five things that need to be fulfilled, three on the day of, as any plenary indulgence, and two that do not have to be on the day of. Uh, the three things that have to be done on the day of is communion in a state of grace, okay? Uh, the prayers for the needs and intentions of the Holy Father, and the fulfillment of the act that grants the indulgence. And for the Divine Mercy Sunday, it's veneration of the image on the day of. So Holy Communion on the day of, prayers for the needs and intentions of the Holy Father on the day of, and also veneration of the image. It could be done privately, like for those who are homebound. It could be done publicly, like the event that we held here at the Fathers of Mercy this past weekend in our General at House, uh, home to our Chapel of Divine Mercy, or like I conducted at uh, wonderful Blessed Mother Parish in Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, we had close to 300 people there. Uh, and I preach that event. Then the two things that do not need to be done on the day of itself, that are the remaining two items that need to be fulfilled to complete the five items to gain a plenary indulgence, is personal detachment from sin, okay? And uh, by that, we mean, uh, it doesn't mean you won't sin again. We're not immaculately conceived. You, you very likely will sin again, hopefully not mortally, but at least venially. But you could fall again mortally. But this is what it means. You make frequent, fervent, and habitual, deliberate acts of the will to want to be removed from all sin, mortal and venial. And indeed, mortal sin is very rare in your life, and venial sin is hopefully very rare in your life, but if, if it's not very rare in your life, uh, hopefully it's, 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 it's not consuming your life either, right? So a, a personal will detachment from all sin, mortal and venial, means in the mind of the church, when granting the plenary indulgence, that you make frequent, fervent, deliberate acts of the will and live this, what I'm about to say, that you indeed want to be removed from all stain of sin, mortal and venial. And the fifth item that, do, that has to be fulfilled, which is the second item that does not have to be done on the day of divine mercy itself, is going to confession. And like with any plenary indulgence, you have up to 20 days before Divine Mercy Sunday to go to confession. Even if all you have is venial sins, 
you still go to confession just to confess those venial sins to fulfill the requirement that our Lord told St. Faustina, okay? So you have up to 20 days to go, but it's understood that if you go during that 20 days that you stay out of a state of mortal sin if you're not planning to go again on Divine Mercy Sunday or any other day leading up to Divine Mercy, Divine Mercy Sunday that you'll stay in a state of grace, meaning that you're simply not aware of any mortal sin in your soul uh, with sincerity of heart, and you... Uh, receive Holy Communion on Divine Mercy Sunday, but you can go 15 days, you can go 19 days, you can go 20 days before Divine Mercy Sunday. The main thing is, is that you stay in a state of grace. Does that help you out, those those five elements? The one thing I didn't do was pray for the Holy Father on that Sunday. Can I do that now? Sure, because you didn't do it with fullness of will. You didn't, you didn't purposely not do it. You just were not aware of it. And that's for the plenary indulgence now. Now, the extraordinary grace, which is different from the plenary indulgence, the plenary indulgence is what the Holy Father, St. John Paul II, added to Divine Mercy Sunday. The plenary indulgence, the extraordinary grace, excuse me, that our Lord told St. Faustina about, you can also read at the same website, thedivinemercy.org thedivinemercy.org, it's tied to the Marians of the Macca Conception, great, wonderful website, uh, is a complete remission of, the, of, of sin as though you never uh, even committed it, uh, which, which is different from a plenary indulgence because the plenary indulgence leaves the temporal punishment. The extraordinary grace does not. And you still need to fulfill Holy Communion and confession, however. This is why sometimes you'll read in, in approved documents concerning Divine Mercy Sunday that it, the extraordinary grace, I'm not talking about the plenary indulgence now, I'm talking about the extraordinary grace, it's almost like a second baptism. Not that it's a sacrament or anything, but its effect is similar to a baptism. Uh, I don't even like to say second baptism because there is no such thing. Its, its effects are almost like a, what baptism does, is that, you know, if a if a 30 year old enters the catholic church at the easter vigil and they've never ever ever been baptized there's no need to go to confession first because the baptism will not only wipe away the original sin it wipes away all personal sin that's been committed mortal and venial up till that night at the easter vigil and any temporal punishment due to it so the baptism granted to the 30 year old at the easter vigil it's like the person never ever ever committed those sins because the baptism wipes away the original sin the personal actual sin whether mortal or venial and the temporal punishment due to those sins. The plenary indulgence uh, also wipes away the temporal punishment, but this, the, the, the record of sin still remains, that you had committed that sin, even though the temporal punishment is wiped away. With the extraordinary grace, the record of sin is wiped away, as is the temporal punishment. This is why it's called an extraordinary grace. It has a similar effect to baptism. So any any sins committed after baptism, if one receives the extraordinary grace, it wipes away the record of that sin committed after baptism. This is precisely an extraordinary grace. There's no other uh, grace like it in the church. And now, it's not a sacrament. It's not baptism. It simply has a similar effect to it. And that extraordinary grace does not have attached to it to pray for the needs and intentions of the Holy Father. Only the divine mercy devotion does. Now remember, when, when talking about the plenary indulgence, we need to realize that the plenary indulgence is granted by the authority of Holy Mother Church, the Bride of Christ, which he founded, and which we know by her four marks, one holy Catholic and apostolic, and which she grants based on the merits of her bridegroom, who died for her and all of her members, right? So that's very, very important to remember. So it, it's worth reading here uh, the, the indulgence here uh, in, found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church so that we can understand it better. An indulgence is the remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sin whose guilt has already been forgiven. A properly disposed member of the Christian faithful can obtain an indulgence under certain prescribed conditions through the help of Holy Mother Church, which as the minister of redemption in her bridegroom's stead, since his ascension Thursday, 40 days after he rose from the dead, till he comes again on the day of judgment, she acts in his stead, the bride does, okay, uh, through certain prescribed conditions, through the help of the church, which is the minister of redemption, dispenses and applies with authority 
the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and the saints. An indulgence is partial if it removes part of the temporal punishment due to sin, or it is plenary if it removes all punishment due to sin, and the divine mercy indulgence is plenary. So the extraordinary grace and the plenary indulgence are different. The extraordinary grace comes directly from our Lord, directly from our Lord, and is told to St. Faustina, which she records. John Paul II attached the indulgence with his own authority from the chair of Peter. So at the following website, thedivinemercy.org, both are discussed. It's a great website to take a look at. Thank you so much for a, a great question. And did you participate in a Divine Mercy celebration in your parish? I did. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda, for a great call. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Grab one of these open phone lines at 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Tuesday with Father Wade Menezes. EWTN Radio is seeking a dynamic radio producer to join the EWTN Radio team in Irondale, Alabama. The right candidate will be a passionate, multi-skilled, talented professional who can manage and direct all aspects of producing world-class programming and play an integral part in Mother Angelica's mission. If this is you or someone you know, email a resume and cover letter, including salary requirements, to humanresources at EWTN.com. This is Father Joseph Mary of the Franciscan Missionaries of the Eternal Word. Let's pray with Mother Angelica. Lord God, make us repentant. Oh, not with just that momentary repentance over some fault or sin. More than that, Lord, give me an attitude of repentance, a deep awareness that I stand before Thee always as a sinner, but glorifying your goodness, your love, your compassion, your mercy, and that you love me, Lord, just as I am. Let me look at that, Lord. Let me never be discouraged, no matter how far I fall or how long I stay there. Let me always know I can rise to a totally new life, and I can be reborn and renewed in thy love. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your love and your goodness. Amen. Amazon Echo is a smart speaker that allows you to use just your voice. You can listen to EWT and radio just by saying, Alexa, play EWT and radio. Check out the Amazon Echo today. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Later today on Catholic Answers Live, two hours of open forum, Carlo Broussard, Tim Staples, Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWT and radio. Now, back to Open Line with Father Wade and Jesus. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Wide open phone lines for you on this Tuesday. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-3986. And Father, you wanted to take a minute and put a little bow on this whole topic of the Divine Mercy Sunday celebration. Yes, uh, one thing regarding the uh, extraordinary grace and one thing re uh, regarding the time to go to confession uh, for either the extraordinary grace or for the plenary indulgence. Uh, regarding the extraordinary grace by itself, not talking about the plenary indulgence here, the requirement to be detached from sin is just not that. It's not required. That's part of the extraordinary grace. You do not need to have that 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 worked toward perfect, habitual, will, deliberate intention to want to be removed from all sin, mortal or venial, where for the plenary indulgence, that sentiment is required, but for the extraordinary grace, it is not. So that was the first thing I wanted to make as, as an addendum to what I told Linda in our last uh, phone call, our first phone call. And the second thing that I wanted to say, Jack, that, that regards both the plenary indulgence and the extraordinary grace is that you have 20 days to go to confession leading up to Divine Mercy Sunday and up to 20 days to go to confession after Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, 
I've talked about this in the past, talking about plenary indulgences, and at the beginning of Lent, I've said many times that, that 40 means something in Scripture, both the Old and New Testament, right? 40 means something, that the great flood was 40 days, Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, Moses was on top of Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, receiving the law, the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. The manna rained down on the Israelites and fed them for 40 years. Uh, when Moses sent the 12 princes out, each one from each ancestral tribe, they reconnoitered the land of Canaan for 40 days. Uh, the prophet Elijah walked 40 days. Jesus fasted for 40 days and nights to prepare for his, his three years of public ministry, right? Uh, it's posited by some theologians that Jesus lay in the tomb for some 40 hours, uh, before his glorious resurrection from Friday late afternoon when he was placed in the tomb until early Sunday morning. So it covered three calendar days, but but it was around 40 hours, according to some theologians that have posited that. Uh, he ascended into heaven 40 days after his glorious resurrection, right? Uh, from Christmas Day to the day of the presentation of the Lord in the temple, February 2nd, that's 40 days. And a human gestation period is around 40 weeks, so all these temporal things about 40 and Old Testament and New Testament things about 40, here's the point. 40 means something. It appears in the Bible some 157 times. And in sacred scripture, the number 40, whether in days or weeks or whatever, signifies such things as new life, new growth, transformation, a change from one great task to another great task, etc., uh, it can also symbolize a time of, of testing and waiting for a, a glorious outcome, right? Well, get this. For a plenary indulgence, uh, even the seeking of a partial or plenary indulgence has a period of 40 days as the time allotted to make a good holy confession. That is, within 20 days before or within 20 days after the spiritual indulgence activity was carried out. You have 20 days before the, act, the calendar day that you did the activity for the plenary indulgence or up to 20 days after the calendar day that you did the activity of the plenary indulgence uh, to carry that out. So what's that total? 40 days. 20 days before the day that you carried out the indulgence act, up to, 40, up to 20 days after. Uh, so a total of 40 days. So again, 40 means something because a plenary indulgence renews us. It rids us of our, of our temporal punishment, either fully plenary or at least partially, if it's a partial indulgence. I'm telling you, every Catholic library, home library, should have the book of indulgences that you can get at any Catholic website or bookstore that's worth their grain of salt, as the old saying says, uh, and, and get it. It's the, it's the book of indulgences. There's over 250 uh, spiritual acts to be carried out to grant the individual, the plenary or partial indulgence, which is given by the authority of the church based on the merits of her bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and what he won for us from the cross on that Good Friday, and also through his resurrection and ascension into heaven. Uh, it's, it's only because of him that his bride, the church, is able to grant a plenary or partial indulgence. There's also a great section in the Catechism on the indulgences, on, on the doctrine of indulgences, and I want to direct our listeners there as well. Thank you so much. Great, great question again, Linda. Thank you. Lisa is up next. She's a first-time caller in Austin, Texas, listening on the EWTN app. Lisa, you are on with Father Wade. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. I so appreciate this show in EWTN. Um, Father Wade, you are so knowledgeable. Um, thank you. Thank you for your service to all of us. Um, thank you. I have a question about relics. So recently I've attended a lot of events where they had relics, relics of St. Jude. On Divine Mercy Sunday they had the relic of Faustina, a relic of Padre Pio, and um, a relic of St. Pope John Paul. They had his mitre. And these things are behind glass. And so... I'm just trying to understand because we we touched the glass. I held prayer cards to the glass, and now they say that the prayer cards are third class relics. And so I'm just trying to understand how this works because they're behind glass. I'm not actually touching the relic. And now that I have these prayer cards that did touch glass, what what does all of that mean? And yeah, so. So, great question. There, there's three classes of relics. A relic is a fragment of the body or physical possession 
of a canonized saint that can help us grow closer to God, right, um, in general. A relic is a fragment of the body or physical possession of a canonized saint that can help us grow closer to God, we would say. Now, let's break this down. Relics are divided into three classifications. A first-class relic is a body part of a saint, such as a bone, uh, a, a dried blood droplet, or uh, flesh, or a lock of hair, okay? Second-class relics are possessions that a saint owned. Their desk, for example, their Bible, their bravery, their religious habit, etc., okay? The chair they always sat in in refectory, Okay, now we Fathers of Mercy move around in our refectory, so when nobody has their own chair. Nobody has their own authoritative chair, Jack. You're, not a, you're not a parochial order. <laughs> correct, correct. And a third-class relic, which is what you're intimating about the card having touched the glass that has the relic in it. A third-class third relic are objects that have been touched to a first- or second-class relic, or the saint has touched him or herself, but it was something they did not own, okay? So again, a third-class relic are objects that have been touched to a first or second-class relic, or the saint has touched the item himself or herself, okay? So let's say I'm a great admirer of well, let's say Mother Angelica, her cause isn't introduced, but let's, let's pretend one day it is, and let's say however long down the road, uh, uh, one day, praise God, she's raised to the altars. Uh, but I was stationed at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament for three years, and let's say Mother gave me one of her old Bibles. Remember, she would always have her Bible on her Wednesday Night Live show. Well, Let's say one time she gave me one of her older Bibles, or, or maybe she gave several away, but they were first her in her possession, and she, or she bought it new with the intention to give it to me. She bought it new with the intention to give it to me, and she touched it, and she even gave her maternal blessing to it and gave it to me. Uh, that would be a third-class relic. In fact, I have. Uh, the Luminous Mysteries had not been uh, universally promulgated by John Paul II yet, uh, that happened in 2002, uh, with Oct uh, in October, um, October 2002. Sometime before that, Mother gave me a 15-decade rosary, a, a large black bead rosary. So it only has the 15 decades on it. It doesn't have the 20 on it, but it has the 15. And she gave me that as a gift, which I still have. And uh, it was an extra one that was in the convent that she said they had, they had redid their style a little bit of their rosaries, and she wanted to give this older style to me. Well, she touched that and she gave it to me. So that would be a third class relic. So uh, does that help you out? Is she still there? Yeah, she's, uh, she's on line three now, Michael. Now she's on, what, by the way? There we okay. are. Yeah, so does, does that help you out? It does. I guess what I'm trying to understand is I didn't actually touch the relic, though I touched the glass. Well, so you're not... They had a piece yeah, the, the, mind of the, the mind of the church is that it touches the relic itself. That is the mind of the church, not that it necessarily touches the glass of the reliquary that the relic is behind, you know. So when I, you know, when I bless a person with St. Faustina's relic like I did on Sunday at the parish I was at preaching the Divine Mercy Celebration, I bless them with the relic, uh, which is a form of veneration on their part of the relic, but they didn't literally touch the relic. So they don't, the, their lock of hair that I touched the, re, the reliquary to the top of their head and then gave them a sign of the cross with it, that doesn't make their lock of hair a third class relic because it was touched by Faustina. Uh, that's not the mind of the church. So the mind of the church, again, it's very, the church is very, very clear. In fact, the, the, this, this very precise wording was given in an overhaul by the church's authority about seven years ago. Again, the relics are divided into three classifications. A first-class relic is a body part of a saint, such as a, a bone or a lock of hair. Second-class relics are possessions that the saint literally owned, like their religious habit, their Bible, etc. And a third-class relics are objects that have been touched to a first- or second-class relic, or the saint has touched the, the item himself or herself. So let me tell you what a classic third-class relic is. This is a, an example of a classic third-class relic. A piece of cloth or wool 
that is touched literally to a first class relic, say a, a lock of hair or a, a part of the bone of the saint. And then that cloth is cut up in little squares and it's attached, it's, it's attached, say with a little spot of glue to a holy card of the saint. It's not the card that's the third class relic of the saint. It's the piece of square cloth that's on the card. I have many of those. I have a Padre Pio one. I have a Mother Teresa one. I have a St. Anthony Mary Claret one. I have several of those where it's the piece of wool, and I've also heard it can be 100% cotton. It has to be 100% uh, uh, natural, non-synthetic fabric, either cotton or wool. It's touched literally to the bone or to the lock of hair. It's touched literally to the first-class relic, not a second-class relic. It's touched to a first-class relic. Then it, this cloth, is cut up, and it's attached to the, a holy card that has an image, an effigy, an effigy, if you will, an image of the saint himself or herself. And now, now you're in possession of a third-class relic in that little piece of square. You're not in possession of a third-class relic in the card itself that it's glued to, no, but rather in the cloth that literally touched the first-class relic. Hopefully that helps you out. Uh, I, I want you to, to go to either EWTN.com for frequently asked questions on first, second, and third class relics, and, all, and or also um, Catholic.com, which is Catholic Answers out of San Diego. Thank you so much. We so, really appreciate it. So, by the way, just to be clear, what about these prayer cards that she has that she touched to the reliquary? Third class relics, not third class relics. Not third class relics, right, in my opinion. I, I, I don't believe that's the mind of the church. No. Yeah, I, th I, I think that you're correct there. Thank you, Lisa. We appreciate your patience today. Bob is driving through the great state of Iowa, listening on the EWTN app. Bob, you are on with Father Wade. Hello, Father Wade. Uh, thank you for taking my call and my question. And uh, the question I have is. How uh, do you have any experience in dealing with somebody who fashions himself to be a Nazarite and or the incarnation of John the Baptist? He's a, a fellow trucker, uh, my driving partner, and uh, he's anti-Catholic, but he's anti-every organized church. He, he emphasizes reading the Bible, reading the Bible, reading the Bible. Everywhere we go, he, he talks about this, and uh, I hear nothing more than the fire, hellfire and brimstone from him. And I, I would like to emphasize the, the love and the mercy that God also has. Uh, I understand God can strike us all dead in a second, but that's not where I believe, uh, as I believe the Church would have us be uh, focused on the new hell, right? And so, so what is it? What is it exactly you're you're asking me? What's the best way to approach him on the more the, the merciful side of Christ and 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 whatnot? What is it you're asking exactly? Well, for instance, he, he when I brought up Jesus and how Jesus showed mercy and forgiveness, like to the, wo the woman who was going to be stoned. Uh, he says, but uh, he says, don't forget, Book of Revelation, who rules with the scepter of iron? You know, and, and he, has, he has a comeback for every one of my, in, <laughs> my statements of, of Jesus and the mercy that uh, uh, the... Uh, the divine mercy that, that Jesus has. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I feel stymied. Now, I, I don't know if it's my nature. I, I've always been a very agreeable person. I, I try not to ruffle feathers. I always go for the diplomatic approach. Yeah. And, you know, uh, but he's not been this way. <laughs> he's right. not that way. Well, you need to approach him from apologetical standpoint, obviously, to, you know, apologetics is to argue for the faith, not not in argument how we typically understand that word with a verbal fight. That's not what argument means here when we talk about apologetics. It, it means the word defend. Obviously, you need to approach him apologetically and defend the faith and feel comfortable doing that. 
uh, the difficulty here with him is that he's he would not he would say himself that he doesn't belong to any one Protestant faith. Um, so you're going to have a particular interesting time with this man. But there's a great book out there. It sounds like you're going to have to be short and to the point with him in a very charitable way. And a great book where you can approach that with him is The One-Minute Apologist, Essential Catholic Replies to Over 60 Common Protestant Claims by Dave Armstrong. Uh, if you didn't write that down now while you're on the air with me, just go back and listen to the podcast at a quarter till uh, the hour, which it is right now, and, and you'll find me repeating this once the podcast is posted. But again, it's the One Minute Apologist, Essential Catholic Replies to Over 60 Common Protestant Claims by Dave Armstrong. There's also a book titled Crossing the Tiber, which is excellent, Evangelical Protestants Discover the Historical Church by Steve Ray. And Steve himself is a convert. Again, Crossing the Tiber, Evangelical Protestants Discover the Historical Church by Steve Ray. And then The Case for Catholicism, Answers to Classic and Contemporary Protestant Objections by Trent Horn, who is with Catholic Answers in San Diego. So The Case for Catholicism, Answers to Classic and Contemporary Protestant Objections. Now, what I like about these three books is that the chapters are fairly short, to help you, the Catholic apologist, defend your arguments in a concise, clear way to the person that you're charitably discussing the faith with. And, you know, you might even want to buy a copy of either of these three books uh, for him, you know. Uh, there's also one, I, I haven't read this one, this one's by John Martinoni, uh, but it's titled, A Blue Collar Answer to Protestantism, Catholic Questions Protestants Can't Answer. Again, a blue-collar answer to Protestantism, Catholic questions that Protestants can't answer. And that's by John Martinoni, our friend. And I have not read that one yet, but I've heard that that one is also very, very good. So again, you can go back and listen to the podcast to write down these four titles with their authors. But those are four great books, uh, the fourth one being one that I've heard great things about, the first three that I'm very familiar with. Uh, personally, that uh, will provide you with the tools needed to discuss with him uh, uh, the challenges that he puts to you about defending your, your Catholicism. Does that kind of help you out? It does. May, may I get a follow-up? or real? Well, Bob, I think we've got some folks waiting in line, so we appreciate your call today. We're going to move on and make sure we get to as many people as we can during the hour here. You know, I love Tuesdays because it's not only Father Wade, but it's also Mother Angelica Live Classics Night. Uh, tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Tonight, Mother talks about the parable of the wedding feast at Cana, and she points out that at every Mass, a wedding feast is taking place. She meditates on the parable which our Lord compares to the kingdom of heaven. That's Mother Angelica Live Classics tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio and Television. Next up is Al in Columbia, Missouri, listening on Covenant Radio. Al, you're on with Father Wade. Hey, Father Wade. Um, we, we hear that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in our Bible uh, study discussion today, we were discussing exactly what sin was expiated by Christ's crucifixion. And the discussion centered sort of on original sin, because original sin is still with us, and the rest of the world today is still a mess. So can you explain what sin was taken away by Christ's crucifixion? The original sin through baptism. The seven sacraments are made possible through Christ's paschal mystery, the four-event event of his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven is what constitutes his paschal mystery, quote, end quote. And the paschal mystery is what makes the seven sacraments possible, available, and real. Three sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist, two sacraments of vocation and mission— uh, holy orders and matrimony, holy orders for the spiritual life and matrimony for the physical life, and then two sacraments of healing, anointing of the sick, and confession for the body-soul composite that we are. Uh, and it was because of his sacrifice on the cross that we have the sacramental economy of the church 
And baptism is called the gateway sacrament because it's normally the first one. It acts as a gate, a gateway to the other six. We call it the gateway sacrament because it's ordinarily the first one received before any of the other six can be received. And it wipes away the original sin. So it sounds like your group was confusing the original sin being wiped away at baptism through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross from his Paschal mystery, confusing that reality with the effects of the original sin that still remain in the world. So the church fathers tell us, as does church teaching, that before the fall of our first parents, which ushered in the original sin, we had an enlightened uh, intellect and a strengthened will. But after the fall of our first parents, which ushered in the original sin, uh, the two chief effects of that original sin is that the enlightened intellect became darkened and the strengthened will became weakened. So the effects of those two gifts of the human person's nature, body and soul, their, their intellect and their will, uh, suffered from the original sin. But baptism wipes away the original sin, but does not wipe away the effects of the original sin because all of creation was adversely affected by it. So not only do we have moral issues like concupiscence, which is simply described by the church as the tendency towards sin or the tugs towards temptation, that's what concupiscence is. Um, we not only have the moral issues in that regard, but we also have physical realities in that regard, like natural disasters, right? We read in the book of Genesis, God tells Adam, because you have done this, O man, from henceforth you shall toil by the sweat of your brow. And because you have done this, O woman, from henceforth you shall give birth with the pangs of labor. So it's interesting, Thomas Aquinas teaches that even if the fall of our first parents had not have taken place, we would still have to work. The only difference is we would enjoy it. <laughs> we would enjoy work, right? So uh, the original sin did not usher in work. The original sin ushered in the sweat of the brow, the toil of the labor, of the work. That's what the original sin did, okay? So we not only have physical evils, okay? We have like, like natural disasters, earthquakes, whatever. We also have moral evils like adultery, fornication, uh, illicit drug use, wars between nations, etc. And these are the, ef the effects of the original sin's two chief effects, which is the darkened intellect and the weakened will. Because before the fall, we had an enlightened intellect and a strengthened will. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. So it sounds like your group was not making a proper distinction between the original sin itself, which is wiped away through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, through the sacrament of baptism, which is made possible by his sacrifice, versus the effects of the original sin that still remain in the physical, corporeal, created world, even after the person is baptized. But the good news is the person can conform their life to Christ and become sanctified and holy and lead others, with God's grace, to sanctification and holiness by pursuing what is good, true, and beautiful by such helps as the seven sacraments, religious piety, divine and sacred worship, which fulfills the first three of the Ten Commandments, charity towards one's neighbor, which fulfills the remaining seven commandments, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Only the first three of the Ten Commandments have to do with love of God. The remaining seven have to do with, seven, with uh, love of neighbor. So, Al, hopefully that helps you out. What a great question. I admire you and your group for asking such great questions. God bless you now. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? I certainly will, Jack. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon all of our Open Line Tuesday listeners this day and always. And as I get my St. Joseph Terror of Demons pen into focus here, Jack, St. <laughs> Joseph Terror of Demons. Pray for us. On behalf of our host, Father Wade Menezes, our producer, Michael McCall, call screener Matt Kubensky and our social media maven, Mr. Ace McKay. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Back at it tomorrow with Father Mitch. Until then, God bless. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. Next time on EWTN Live. 
Father Timothy Vaverick invites Christians to truly witness Christ's sacrificial love and how it redeems our sins and saves 